We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new hearts and right spirits, that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Amen. Receive good news. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. All your sin is forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for you. Amen. <laughs> to Palm Sunday, I want us to just take a moment. We're going to acknowledge the fact that we have really lost this past year together. So uh, some of you lit some candles, uh, which is great. We're going to do that again on Good Friday, so you're welcome to do that. We'll probably leave those up for a while uh, as we kind of remember this past year and uh, the people we've lost, the things we've lost. Uh, and at the same time, God's continuing promise to us that uh, light shines in the darkness and cannot overcome it. Let's just take a moment, we're going to pause, we're going to think about that, and then uh, we're going to switch gears quickly to move to Palm Sunday, because Carol's excited, she can't wait, she's just bouncing up and down with the palm over there. So uh, we're going to just take a moment now and uh, remember this past year. Gracious God, you always meet your people in exile. You come to the lonely and the brokenhearted. You come as your son to break into our, our world, into our lives, into this community. And we give you thanks that you have seen us through this past year as we both acknowledge what we have lost and give thanks for the opportunity that is before us to be together this day. So with that, we give you thanks for joining us here, and we give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, it is Palm Sunday, and so you probably have a palm, so I invite you to hang on to that. We'll kind of wave it around a little bit. We've got our uh, prayer of giving thanks for the palms we're going to do. We're going to hear the story, and we'll think about that together. So let us pray. pray. We praise you, O oh God, for redeeming the world through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, he entered the holy city in triumph and was proclaimed Messiah and King by those who spread garments and branches along his way. Bless these branches and those who carry them. Grant us grace to follow our Lord in the way of the cross so that joined in his death and resurrection, we enter into life with you. Through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. I don't know if Tammy mentioned it or not, but we have a bunch of these. So if you want to take some more with you or to share them with some people, please uh, please grab some on your way out. Either of these here or we got another big batch inside. All right. Our Palm Sunday Gospel today comes from John. Where he records, the next day the great crowd had come to the festival and had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, 
Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when he was glorified, when they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they had heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went out to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. All right, well, I was thinking of uh, this morning as we've gathered now in two places and over the course of these last weeks, kind of coming back home again, uh, at least to our, our spiritual home, our faith-filled home, this place, as long with all the, the fine faces that support us in this life. Uh, I was I was thinking of how how this week not this week this year of exile has really felt and in this past week how it feels almost a little twilight zoning because uh, things are kind of opening again it, it felt good to be inside it feels good to be gathered together I mean it feels natural in a sense but it also feels kind of odd since we had also been away for the amount of time we've been away and uh, we can account for the time and we can account for the things that we've had to endure. Uh, one, just what that exile has been like on a daily basis. Uh, two, the things that we have lost and the people we've lost and just the amount of suffering around us in the world. And three, this whole concept of getting back to normal when you've been gone so long, when you're kind of in new patterns, it, it's, it just feels weird because you're trying to go back to things you know and, and feel supported by and, and can attest to, and yet you don't really know exactly how it's going to end up. And at the same time, you know that anybody that tells you this is exactly how it's going to go uh, doesn't really know what they're talking about either, because we're all figuring it out as we go. So as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, all right, what's it mean that someone comes into town on a donkey uh, with these branches being waved around basically announcing that exile is over, uh, that the time of the kingdom has arrived, that uh, all those promises you had heard for such time are now about to be fulfilled. And what I really started thinking about was not that this story was even about Jesus, which of course it is, uh, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, uh, but this echoes other stories throughout the scriptures. Uh, I had kind of forgotten this, um, but... Uh, King Solomon enters into town on a, a mule, but on a, on a pack animal, and they, they wave branches for him, and they shout, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, which basically is the signal that the new king is on the job. Uh, it had started even before that, when the people who had been kind of clamoring for position in this land, after God had uh, delivered them out of slavery in Egypt and brought them there, and had uh, fought against the, the people who threatened them time and time again, where they said, you know what we need is a king. If we had a king, we'd be able to defend ourselves and really establish who we are. Uh, and the last judge, the first kind of great prophet, Samuel, said, well, you really don't want a king, because if, you want, if you're gonna have a king, you are gonna end up like everybody else. In a world that's so full of, of violence and greed and, and power plays and, uh, the, the way that oppression happens, you're gonna end up being slaves again is what's gonna happen. Uh, but they said, no, no, Samuel, we know better. We want a king. So they found a king, a guy named Saul, who looked the part, but didn't quite work out. Uh, and then they, they found a guy named David who, who acted like a king, because when it was time to fight, the guy could fight. David was a warrior, first taking out Goliath, and then all of these battles against the Philistines. And everybody thought, well, David, is pretty great. Even though uh, David wasn't perfect by any means and got himself into trouble and even became, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, separated from his family members, including his sons, most of them. Uh, Absalom revolted and wanted power for himself and the country, this new forming kingdom, was uh, suddenly in civil war. And David had to kind of defend the likes of his power as well as uh, take on his sons most of whom 
uh, died in battle in that great struggle. And then as uh, David was nearing the end of his life, having really conquered his enemies, both internal and external, uh, people were wondering, well, who's the next king going to be? Uh, and he's got another son named Adonijah, which I know we all have a friend named Adonijah, right? Um, at, least, at least one or two. Um, Adonijah, who was the oldest, was really the next in line. So he started uh, getting his act together while David's on his deathbed. He's got David's old advisors. He's holding what I would call kind of the equivalent of like a political rally. He's got, you know, all the who's who of Jerusalem around him. Uh, everybody's getting speeches and offering congratulatory remarks and offering things to the people, uh, you know, and it's a, it's a big party and everybody's excited that Adonijah is going to take over uh, until the prophet Nathan shows up. And uh, he's the same one that confronted David about his uh, relationship with Bathsheba. But he, he approaches Bathsheba and said, if you are going to survive this changeover of power, you need to go to David now. So Bathsheba and Solomon, their son, go to David. And David blesses him and makes him the king. And as a, a sign of that coronation of what it looks like, uh, Solomon gets on his pack animal and rides down the city streets of Jerusalem and everybody gets their palm branches out and they're waving them around and uh, shouting hosannas and blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord because everybody knows exactly what this means. This is the king. Period. Even Adonijah gets it and he backs off and says, well, you must be the king now. Uh, Solomon deals with him, unfortunately. Uh, but but offers a, a kind of stability now to the kingdom. And what Solomon brings is exactly what Samuel warned against. Uh, there is stability, but there's also a great influence of, of commerce and, and trade with foreign entities and uh, clamoring for power in the world. And this new forming country of Israel is starting to really make its mark. And Solomon, he's got... 700 wives, which is a big deal on Valentine's Day. Um, but he's, he's getting it all put together. But he also, he builds the temple, which is like the, the, the house of God for, for all time. It's just like that tent that traveled around with them with the Ten Commandments, now made permanent. So God would be with them uh, forever, except Solomon strays, just as so many of the other kings do, because with all that foreign influence and all these wives, all these other statues of all these other gods end up in the temple too. And before long, Israel's just like everybody else. He even enslaves the population to build the temple. Oops. Uh, and after he dies, the, the country falls into almost another civil war, but avoids further bloodshed by splitting in half and forming two separate countries. Uh, and then what we hear about over the next couple of hundred years is how wicked and terrible and corrupt one leader is after the next, save, save only a couple, uh, who remembered who they were supposed to be, that they were supposed to be a blessing to the nations, not seeking power among them. That they had this, this covenant, this, this special relationship with God that was supposed to be about loving God and, and loving other people. And that because they had been once enslaved themselves and had come out of Egypt to this new land, they were supposed to be a, a people of hope and promise uh, to everybody they encountered. And, and they lost it all. It, it took a couple centuries, but before long, the Assyrians invaded the north and took them out. And they invited, invaded the south, the Babylonians, and took them out too. And foreign occupation for, for centuries. And then this guy came along who I kind of forgot about because he's not in our Protestant Bibles, but he's, he's in the book of the Maccabees, which means the hammer. Uh, and his name is Judas Maccabeus, who is the hammer. I think of like Thor, the Avenger, uh, coming in. And he is a warrior type. He sees all that's going on in the world and especially in uh, all these other people taking over them. And he kind of remembers these days of old. So he first uh, invades and takes over the temple and, and purges it and cleans it out and tries to reclaim their uh, monotheism and this story that God saved them out of Egypt. Uh, that this is who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to live into this covenant and be a blessing to others. Uh, but they, you know, nobody left him alone, so he's in one fight after the next, uh, uh, but he wins, even though he's usually outmanned and outgunned. 
And he always has this way before they go into battle to say, well, remember these stories of old. And he tells the story of the Exodus and they fight and they win. And he tells the story of David and the Philistines and they go out and win. And he tells the story of a couple of the, the actual good kings, one named Josiah, who actually fended off uh, the Assyrians for a time. But he, and people started to think, maybe this is the Messiah that we've been waiting for, this warrior king, this new David type guy. Uh, after all, when Ezra and Nehemiah were rebuilding the temple, there was this prophet, Zechariah, who told about the day of the Lord coming, when the kingdom would be reestablished, when all the enemies would be um, thwarted and sent away. When, when we hear about, as we hear in this uh, text that's quoted in John, about the daughter Zion rising up, uh, that this is going to be what it looks like. Your, your new king will come riding in on a, on a pack animal, and you'll get these palm branches out, and you'll start waving them around, and you'll say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, because you know deliverance has finally arrived. And so they thought, okay, maybe Judas Maccabeus is our guy, until, of course, he dies in battle. Uh, then the Romans take over, who you know are really great about uh, welcoming other people and affirming what they believe. So they, uh, they, you know, they're ruthless and they're powerful and they, they dominate everybody. And by the time you get to the first century, uh, Jerusalem in particular is, is like a tinderbox. It's ready to just explode with resentment and violence and resistance and rebellion. And you can almost, it's like palpable in the air. The people are ready for something to happen. And here comes Jesus coming in on a donkey with palm branches and shouts of Hosanna. He must have known exactly what he was doing. At least the people would have known exactly what this meant, that the warrior king had come to finally set the people free and set everything straight and establish the kingdom once and for all. Except Jesus was no warrior, was he? I mean, he was one of these guys that went around and like, you know, healed people and uh, forgave their sins and uh, let the, the blind see and the people who couldn't walk stand up and, and walk home. Uh, and he, he challenged the religious authorities for, for trying to keep the laws so tightly instead of exhibiting mercy amongst, amongst people. And so you can see why they didn't, they quickly turn on him. Well, they say, okay, this is gonna be great, Hosanna, to all of a sudden shouts of crucify. We don't want this guy. He's just gonna mess up the thing we got going here. As, as terrible as it is, he's only gonna make it worse. And so when Jesus comes in on a donkey, and when they shout Hosanna, and when they say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the kingdom comes. But not in any of the way that any of us ever really expected. Because rather than coming with all the ways of this world, with, with violence and power and, and greed and corruption and all the things that uh, entangle us all the time, uh, Jesus comes with, with mercy and with self-giving sacrificial love. And he doesn't come to dominate other people. He comes to people one life at a time and, and, and changes their lives. And they go out and, and do the same. And as we see this great drama unfold over this, this week, which quickly turns to betrayal and arrest and suffering and death, the kingdom comes, but it's not a political entity. It's not about revenge. It's not about might. It's not about any of those, those things that as we've seen throughout the pages of history, all come and go and, and fade away. And said, this is a kingdom that has no end because it's a kingdom of God's entrance of love into the world, to the defeat of death with the spark of life, with the defeat of all of our, our brokenness by looking like it, it comes at the hand of, of falling to it, and then yet forgiving us all, one person at a time, one interaction at a time, one act of mercy at a time, all the way through the ages until it reaches you and me. So as we go from here and wave these branches around and pin them to our door or our bulletin board or put them on our fridge or something, uh, know what you're getting yourself into. I mean, this is no ordinary kingdom. 
This is a kingdom that changes the world. It's a kingdom that reaches out to the world. It's a kingdom that can transform the world. But first it comes out to you and me, shouting and acknowledging that the true king has come. And he's coming to our exile to welcome us. Back home. Peace to you. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. When I say, hear us, O God, I invite you to reply, your mercy is great. In creation, life springs from death. Redeem your creation, awaiting resurrection. Restore lost habitats and endangered species. Create new possibilities for areas affected by climate change, grant relief from the natural disasters, and nurture new growth. Hear us, O oh God. Jesus was handed over to the powers of this world. In all nations, inspired, inspired the powerful that they would not exploit their power, but maintain justice. Sustain soldiers, guide those who command them, that they serve those in great need. Hear us, O oh God. You call followers to tend Jesus' body in death. Sustain hospice workers and funeral directors. Bless this congregation's ministries at times of death. Those who plan and lead funerals, those who prepare meals, all who suffer, offer support in grief. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy On the cross, Jesus joined all who feel forsaken. Abide with those who are condemned to death. Console and strengthen those who are mocked or bullied. Accompany all who suffer, especially those on our St. Paul prayer list, as well as those who name aloud or in our heart now. Grant respite and renewal. Hear us, O oh God. You inspired the centurion to confess Jesus as your son. We praise you for the faith you have given to people of all places and times. Give us also such faith to trust the promises and baptism, and with them to look for the resurrection of the dead. Hear us, O oh God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you. O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. So the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, time to share the peace with one another. We'll do that with a big old St. Paul wave, so the peace of the Lord be with you all. Go in peace, serve, serve the Lord. Lord. Rich is excited it didn't rain on them. We made it. We made it. <laughs>